Um, for the last four years, I've had the privilege of leading the Southern Growth Policy Board. It's a 40-year-old public policy think tank that's based in Research Triangle Park. We've been around for a long time. Uh, Governor Brazier was our chair a few years ago. Some of you may have come to the automotive conference we had in Lexington. That was at the beginning of whatever it is that we're either in, out of, or, or moving forward. Uh, I, when I come to other states, they say, why do you have someone from North Carolina coming to talk to you? And I say, well, it's not because we know anything, but it's because we know who to listen to. So we all have our, our people that we listen to. And uh, let's see, this one is not working. Here we go. My favorite's Mike Tyson. Uh, Mike's the best, best philosopher I know. He has the best quotes of anybody I'm aware of. And uh, he has the best quote about this economy, which is that everybody has a plan until they get hit in the mouth. And certainly, this economy that we're in is one of those things that feels like we've been punched right in the mouth. And so I thought I'd do a little bit this morning. We're going to talk most of the morning about trends that are impacting our future. But I thought it was important to set what the current situation is. It's really easy to, to have uh, your nightly news or your whatever you listen to tell you something that slants what the economy currently is. So we're going to try to just figure out what, you can decide whether you think it's good or bad. In fact, I, I'd like to have the room vote. So this is a grade, it's A, B, C, D, or F. The national economy is an A, B, C, D, or F. The Kentucky economy is an A, B, those are the three economic developers in the room, C, D or F. Your local, where you live, economy is an A, B, C, D, or F. Uh, I spoke, I've spoken to 133 groups in the last year. Every single group votes exactly the same way. The national economy stinks. We're doing a little better, and locally we're doing just fine. And by the way, when the U.S. Chamber of Commerce surveys businesses, small businesses, they think it's even better. So this national economy that we have that's made up of small businesses and places that are doing pretty well, we all think stinks. The good news for you is David Brooks in the New York Times says only pessimists are regarded as intellectually serious. So you guys are okay this morning. You're intellectually serious. You've, you've considered this pretty, pretty well. I get described as an economic futurist. I think it's the biggest insult anyone could ever give anybody because we know what we think of economists. And we don't know anything about futurists. Uh, Peter Drucker, who, who is probably the brightest man on this subject, says that predicting the future is like driving down a country road at night, trying to drive while looking out the back window. And so most futurists, all they can look at is what's happened in the past, because everybody who studied futurists realized that nobody's any good at it. If you study ESPN futurists, for all you guys in the room, and at the beginning of this year, you listen to everybody on ESPN predict who's going to make the playoffs this coming year in the NFL. They will hit the exact same ratio as monkeys with darts. 34% was last year's rate. And they're, they're paid to do it. And oh, by the way, you pay to watch them do it. And they're terrible at it. So that's what futurists are like. Economists, everybody here probably has an economist joke. I have several. Uh, that I've been told, but the bottom line is that people who look at economic future that are any good at it are really looking at the current situation and trying to understand which trends are continuing and which trends are about to change. So I understand that all of this is hard to see. That's okay. I'm not going to show you a whole bunch of charts hard to see. The point of this is these are all the economic projections for the next 18 months by the top 50 economists in America. And what you should see up there is that nothing's going to change. This is GDP somewhere between 1.8 and 2.5. If you look at unemployment, somewhere between 8.2 and 7.9. If you look over here at consumer price index, something just over two. Oil, we may go up and down on a monthly basis, but by and, I mean, I love, sorry for any newspapers in the room, but the newspapers who carry the, the headline that the, oil, the gas prices are up 10 cents this week and down 10 cents next week and up 10 cents the next week and down, the economy's where it is right now. And overall stuck 
would be probably one of the ways to describe it. These are global unemployment rates. We're at 8.2, not good. This is Europe at 11%. India's almost 10%. There's a lot of unemployment in the world. We have fewer jobs than we have people everywhere. So it's going to be very hard to fill those in the short run. We'll talk about that a lot today. This is projected gross domestic product growth. We're at 2.2%, Japan at 2 China's at 82 The first quarter of this year, they were at 7 The bad news is they've been above 10 for 30 years. Also, the bad news for them is that they believe that economic stability is at 10. So they're below that. India's below double digit. Europe's in a recession. In this global world that we're living in, right now we're not growing fast enough, and we're going to talk about that some today. Strangest chart I'm going to show you today. Sorry for all the, the busyness. This is the, un, this is the employment chart since 2000. These are monthly gains and losses in employment since 2000. So this is the recession at the beginning of the decade. This are the good times. This is the Great Recession, 8.8 .8 million jobs lost. This is where we hired all of our census workers. And this is where we fired our census workers, right here. And this is 21 months worth of new jobs. We've been gaining jobs now for 21 straight months. We gained 902,000 new jobs this year. We gained 1.6 million jobs last year. If the rest of the year ends up looking, maybe another 1.6 million. But we've regained now 44% of the jobs we lost in this big hole, which means we've, we don't have those jobs. 56% of the jobs aren't here. And then all the jobs we would hope to have grown aren't here. So we dug this very, very deep hole, and we've been climbing out at a slower rate than anybody would like. And that's the economy we're in. We can't seem to generate any of these spiky things. Those spikes are what has always drug us out. If you look at the job creation rates for most of the last decade, they're not much different than the rates we're currently experiencing. But we haven't had the big pluses. The problem is that at this rate, we get back to even another five or six years from now. This is a chart of how fast we've recovered from recessions, all the recessions since World War II. Unfortunately, as you might already have guessed, this is us at the bottom down here, the current recession. So we are now 50 months into the out, coming out of this recession, 50 months from the, the trough and out. We are still 4% below where we started. Now. This recession is the 2001, and this is the 1990. Recessions have changed. This idea that all of a sudden we just bounce back, this certainly is the worst by a long shot. Biggest hole, slowest growth, but we are a long way from back up to the top. This is unemployment in America last year by county for 2011. Good news for you is you're not quite as bad as the rest of the South. This is North Carolina, where I live. Actually, I live in the green area right here, which is good news, although we had to lay off staff during this, too. But this is this Mississippi Delta. This is what's happened to the West Coast. There are a lot of parts of this country that have deep unemployment. By the way, red is over 10.9%. But there are also huge parts of the country where the unemployment rate is now below 6%. It depends where you are in this country. This is a recession or the recovery from a recession that's very different for different places. It's also different for different people. These are unemployment rates based on how old you are. If you're under the age of 25, your unemployment rate now, and, and you're looking for work, you're not in school, you're looking for work, your unemployment rate's 25%. If you're over 55, it's six. If you're a man in this past recession, the male unemployment rate peaked heavily during the recession because of manufacturing and construction job losses. Unemployment rate for men has started to come down, but still very high. 
For women, it never got as high, but has started to go down very slowly because we're laying off people in government and education, which is where a lot of women jobs are. Depends on what color or race you are. If you're African American, your unemployment rate currently is 16% in America. If you're white, it's around eight. And something you heard a lot yesterday, and you're gonna hear a ton about today, it also depends on your education. If you have a BA, and my guess is most of this room has that, your unemployment rate never got above four and a half percent. And oh, by the way, economists now think five is full employment. So if you've got a BA, you've actually been fully employed throughout this recession. But if you've got less than that, you've been hit terribly hard. If you have less than a high school diploma, you're still up here at 14% unemployment. So this is an economy that, not, I mean, we can talk all day about what led to a recession, but part of it are these big global shifts in technology and globalization and the rising talent bar that shifts who's competitive in this workplace and who isn't. These are southern states, one year change in employment. This is from April 2011 to April 2012. You can see that Kentucky is here in the group of four that have done pretty well. That's Texas and Oklahoma and Louisiana and Kentucky. There's some energy connectivity, I think, in those things. This is the change in manufacturing employment, and again, Kentucky's done well, one of the top places in the South. We still have places all over the South that are losing manufacturing jobs, but Kentucky has added them during this time. The fastest growing sectors are other non-metallic metals, electric equipment, industrial machinery, general purpose machinery. The good news is you're doing double digit growth in a bunch of things. Still continuing to transform your manufacturing economy, but pretty broad growth across the manufacturing sectors. Projections for this year, again, 2%. We'd love it to say four, but as you can see, you're one of the highest projected growth areas. So Kentucky doing better than almost anyone. The Maryland one, by the way, and I get, our, people come up to me after every session and say, Maryland's not in the South, and I say yes, but they belong to the Southern Governors Association, and so we do the charts for them. This is laying off from the federal government. So that's the only one out here, but you can see Mississippi and Missouri, Virginia, a lot of places, even, you know, things that, places that we used to think of as having pretty strong growth, one and a half percent doesn't get you out of this anytime soon. This is gross domestic product change over the last four years since the beginning of the recession. You can see most of the South still not back to where they started. This is you guys only down 3.3%, which is one of the lower ones, but you've still not made it all the way back from a gross domestic product. And this is GDP per capita for, and you guys are actually about in the middle, GDP per capita. Some of your high value manufacturing raises you, but you also have a lot of low end workers in the state that bring down your GDP per capita. I don't do much housing anymore simply because nobody, nobody can just stomach it this time of morning. But here's two charts for you real quick. This is the index for the cost of housing going back to 1976. This is, these two dotted lines here are the projected growth in what housing value should be across the country. Oops, excuse me. That is a bubble. If anybody wants to ask you what the definition of a bubble in economics is, that's it. Things that should have been valued about here, all of a sudden got valued here. And this chart, this is about double. And so if you bought property somewhere up in here, I'm sorry. There are a few bankers in the room who probably won't help you, but they'll commiserate with you, I'm sure. The good news is we're back to about normal. Housing costs are pretty close. This year, the projections were 3% national drop, and by next year, even. So there's still air to let out of all of those people who are underwater. About a quarter of Americans are underwater with their housing. So that'll slowly let that air out over time, so you don't expect housing values to come back much. But housing starts have started coming back in some places. And housing prices are now at a 10-year low 
They've continued to come down, so they're back actually slightly below where they were 10 years ago. So if you thought you were going to retire on your house value, and just to you know, be honest, I have some beach property that I bought in 2007 that someone could, you know, anybody who would like to talk to me afterwards, and uh, maybe after the, some more tasting of bourbon, we can talk about it. You did pretty well in Kentucky on this issue. This is the housing price index over the five years, and Kentucky overall values only went down 2.4%, as opposed to Florida, which went down 44%. So think about if you're a local government in Florida and your tax base has been reduced by 40%, your, commercial, your residential tax base. What's that going to do? You're starting to see that in California with cities going bankrupt because California has options that allow citizens to do referendums that say you can't raise the tax rate. And if your base disappears by 40% and you have bills to pay because you borrowed for water and sewer systems or something else, you're stuck. So you're going to continue to see a cascade of those kind of things. So that's the economy charts. The takeaway is better gradually with a really deep hole and no particular reason that we should accelerate out of it. Doesn't matter who's in office, doesn't matter what economic policy. Right now in a global economy, there's not much that's going to cause an acceleration. So that's a lot of charts, and people tell me all the time, you got too many charts, I don't do charts. Okay. So I have a visual for you to try to, to pander to the group this morning. So how many people in the room fish? Raise your hand. If you fish. Okay, good. So this is the economy in a fishing metaphor. It, it's not exactly what you thought you wanted, and you're scared to death something might go wrong. So that's your economic metaphor for where we are with the economy. Now, so we'll do it one more time for you guys. It's some, did I do, I think I pushed the wrong button here. So would you, uh, there we go, I got it. So it's something we have to have, it's something we want to do, it's not what we want, and if the euro goes bad, we're toast. So everybody remember, that's the, when people ask you tonight, what's the economy like, that's the answer. You like that? Great. And you're in leadership, Kentucky? This is a leading thing? Okay. So the question becomes, what's the, so given all of that, what's the new normal? And we're going to start with the fact that the future is not anywhere we're going, it's a place we're making. And that's why y'all are here. You have decisions to make about what you're going to create for Kentucky's future. Because today the world isn't out there trying to figure out how to make Kentucky better. I can assure you, having been to most places around you, that people in Tennessee are not the least bit concerned about how to make Kentucky better. And people in Ohio and people in Indiana, they're not there. And people in California aren't concerned about anybody east of the Mississippi. So what are you going to do? And the answer is you're going to do things based on what you can know best. We think there are 15 trends that are sort of changing the world. I'm only going to talk about a few of them this morning. We're going to talk about seven real quick, but a lot of trends, that, things that we're not talking about are the, the nature of corporate integration, a decentralization of everything, the fact that natural resources are becoming more important, you've seen this with energy and food and water, the fact that customers determine everything now, some of you are in those businesses, changing institutional models and then the speed of it, we're not talking about those, we're talking about a few other ones. Start with urbanization, I was here for the mayors yesterday. We're a world now that lives in urban regions. How many of you were born in a town of under 10,000? Over half the room. How many of you live in a town of under 10,000? A few hands. I was born in Dallas, North Carolina, population 2,600. My mother still lives there. I do not. I live in a huge metropolis of Raleigh-Durham, which is 2 million, and by global standards, isn't even worth talking about little bitty place. We're in a country now where 80% of the people live in metro areas, and we have this vision of the farm, and I grew up on farm, a vision of the farm and the small town. 60% of Americans now live in metros of a million or more. We're a country of big cities, and we're a world that is obsessed with big city discussions these days. 
If you're from a small county or a small city, nobody's talking about what to do to help you right now. This is one of the issues we need to, that we're going to definitely have to get around to in America. We are not having the rural discussions we had in the 50s and 60s when we had rural electrification and we had rural energy and we built TVA and we built an interstate system. We, we're not having any of those discussions now. We're having discussions about how do our big cities compete against other big cities, and I think that's probably the right discussion because somebody's going to have to compete with somebody. I think either Mayor Fisher or Mayor Gray yesterday, one said that, you know, they send so much and they get a little less than that back. Every major city in America says that. It's probably true. They're subsidizing because that's where the energy is. If you want to read more about cities, there's a million books right now. Triumph of the City, Ed Glazer's book, Ed's a Harvard economist, is one of the best that talks about how innovation actually drives cities to be more competitive, which drives them to be more competitive. What we've got today is an urban obsession, and public policy is driving that. Now, it may not be true in Frankfurt, may not be true in a lot of our state capitals in the South, because southern development patterns are not urban in nature. They're built along, you know, they're factories built along streams or, or waterfronts. You know, if, how many of you have been to Colorado? Here's my thing. When you're flying into Colorado, look, if you're flying in from this part of the world, look down for the last 40 minutes that you're on the air flight going to Denver. There's nothing there. I mean, it's big open plains. The development patterns was concentration because water and other things caused it that. If you fly around the South and you look at places like Kentucky or Tennessee or North Carolina or Georgia or Alabama, you got cities everywhere. How do we make them more competitive? Partially is about linking them to urban areas. We're globally interdependent in a way that nobody could have dreamed of years ago. Whose flag? It's Greece's flag. So, so let's go back five years. If you're sitting at your breakfast table, how many of you could imagine the day where you opened your paper or turned on your TV to figure out what the Greek public workers were doing that day to understand what was happening to your 401k? I mean, think about that. How absurd is that entire concept that the Gre we didn't care about Greece unless we were going on vacation for any reason. I mean, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, we wanted some Greek wine or something, but we didn't care at all. And now, if there's a Greek parliamentary debate, our stock market drops 200 points. That's strange, and yet that's the world we're in. Everybody, every economist around today would say, well, we expect this, this, and this, unless something happens to the euro. So here's 10 countries. Macau, Mongolia, Libya, Iraq, Angola, Niger, China, Ethiopia, Rwanda, and Laos. Anybody know what they have in common? Those are the 10 fastest growing GDP countries in the world this year. Now, is there a volunteer to come point them out for me? I mean, think about that. Those 10 countries are the fastest growing. Six of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world right now are Sub-Saharan Africa in terms of, of just percentage growth. This is a world that is completely interconnected. I agree with everything the guys said yesterday on, on uh, exporting. We are a country that has thrived on, far, on our foreign direct investment and foreign interaction. Foreign direct investment in 2010 is the last year that's available. The U.S. had more than twice the inbound foreign direct investment that China had. We are still the place that people choose to put their new investments. When you look at foreign direct investment, yes, North, North American countries and U.S. Co companies send their money out, but we are still getting more in than we send out. Exports have grown 44% in the last three years in America. We figured something out, which is if we're, go we're gonna go slow in our growth and we wanna grow faster, we need to go sell to somebody who's growing faster. It's not a particularly hard concept, but your idea of getting more and more of your businesses to find new markets is the right idea because your markets aren't going to grow that fast. I'll show you some more demographics on that in a minute. This is what the exports look like in America. This is since 1992. 
These are goods. This idea that we don't grow anything or make anything anymore. No, we're still selling more and more. And these are services. Maybe a law firm or two might find their way overseas. I went back and looked at this just to make sure I had it right last night after hearing everything. This is southern state export growth over the last four years. Kentucky's the lowest. Now before that, if you go back, you're, you're faster growing. But it is a perfect public policy to try to increase that dramatically. And the way to do that is to get more people to export. It's 1% of American companies export. And of those, half export to one country. There are lots of markets out there. You need to work on them. And if you want to see how this is going, there's also a wrath of stuff on how we all compete. This is good. If I had to pick one, I'd pick good capitalism, bad capitalism. We're all capitalists now, except that the Chinese version and the Saudi Arabian version and the EU version and our version don't exactly link up. We always tell people it's like the U.S. has been the best boxers in the world for a very long time, but now we're in an MMA fight. We have to adapt to that. The great thing about demography is that you can count it. If I, the gentleman on the front row tells me how old he is today, I can probably tell him how old he'll be a year from now. It's great news because nothing else is predictable. But demographers have been telling people things for a long time. They're starting to come true. A few things we didn't see coming. The first is that the economy and a few other things have caused growth in America to start slowing dramatically. We're having much, much less procreation than we once had. There are no slides on this, I promise. So, This is growth rates by region. The South has traditionally grown at a much faster rate than parts of the country, but we've slowed dramatically in new people coming in. In fact, if you look at states, you guys are the red one. You did not grow as fast as a lot of southern states. This is, for instance, North Carolina up here where I'm from. But you can see North Carolina was growing at 2.5% a year and is now down to 1. You guys were growing under 1% again, but you're down, down to a half. This idea that southerners have been able to live and grow their economies by having a bunch of northerners, midwesterners, or whoever move in, slowed dramatically over the last few years. 92% of the U.S. population growth in the 2000s was minority growth. 92%. That's, even minority growth is slowing fairly dramatically, but we're becoming a, vi a much more diversified country. And that we've been saying we we're going to do that for a long time, but now it's real. If you look at the ethnic composition of the U.S. just since 1990 to 2010, of the young people 18 to 24 going to college and going into the workplace, it was 71% in 1990 were white. It's 58% now and dropping dramatically. So this stuff you've been hearing about for a long time is now here. Oh, by the way, in 2010 there were more Asian immigrants into the U.S. than Hispanic immigrants. You don't hear this one all that often anymore. We seem to be obsessed with some of these issues. Now, does it include illegals? No. By most estimates, though, half of illegal immigrants have gone home because there's no work. 